Welcome everyone, the plan for this video is to show you how I built a blog website that is a login system using vanilla PHP, MySQL and vanilla JavaScript. So we are going to create an application that allows users to log into the dashboard, upload images, create articles and also view them publicly on the front end. But wait, you might want me to answer a few questions before we proceed. First, why did I build it using vanilla PHP? when there are frameworks like Laravel out there. To answer that question, I decided to do it with vanilla PHP because the aim of this project was to showcase how to create something useful in the real world without depending on any frameworks. And I think that's the best way to learn the fundamentals of PHP and get familiar with it. Maybe in the future we can rebuild this application with Laravel. So that's an idea for another video. Second, why did I choose to create a blogging system? There are already tons of them, right, like WordPress. But our aim is to learn coding with PHP, not to rival WordPress or any other existing systems. And for that purpose, I thought a blogging site is the best fit because it's simple yet complex enough to demonstrate all the concepts. You will get a hang of performing CRUD operations that is create, read, update and delete with just PHP and how to interact with a MySQL database. A blog can be thought of as a lightweight content management system that is a CMS. It's not as complex as an e-commerce site but much more than a simple to-do list app with user login, image upload etc. By the way, this is not going to be a coding tutorial as usual. Instead, I will walk you through the demo. Then I will show you how to set up that demo on your machine by cloning the GitHub repo so that you can play around with it. Finally, we will also have a sneak peek at the code discussing what all things I could learn by doing this project. So you can learn those as well. So let's go to the demo. And this is the login page. Once logged in, you will be redirected to the articles page. The dashboard also includes a top bar with options to switch between dark mode and light mode. The top bar also displays the currently logged in user and provides a link to visit the site's frontend as well as a logout option. The dashboard includes a navigation menu on the left side. The first section is dedicated to articles. In the articles section, all the existing posts are displayed in a table format. Pagination is also available at the bottom. It's implemented to ensure a better user experience, allowing users to view the list of posts in a paginated style rather than a, as a single long list. At the top, there is a form that allows you to add a new article. For instance, if I type in the title of an article, sample article and then click the add article button it takes me to the article edit page here i can modify the title add content etc for instance let me add some paragraphs here is some content by the way for the editor part i am using the editor js javascript package it's a blog style editor that outputs everything in json format it allows you to add paragraphs and other elements to the page such as lists, images, headings, etc. The block editor even allows you to move the individual blocks up or down. Click the dots icon to open the options menu. If I want to move the list block one level up, I can click the move up button in the drop down menu. Okay. You can also insert images into the editor. There are two options. Either you can upload an image directly from the computer using the image tool or you can also choose the insert image option to select an image from the image library. And here I am going to select an image by clicking the select an image option and it will be uploaded to the editor. By the way, the uploaded image will be available in the image library. From there, you can view and manage the uploaded images. The image library provides easy access to the uploaded images. If you want to further edit the details about a particular image, such as setting an image title or even deleting the image permanently, you can do so. 
For instance, if I set the image title to lake view and then save the image. Now refresh the page and you can see the title being displayed at the top. Also this title will be used as the images alternate text at appropriate places. So that's all with the image block. On the other hand, if you want to insert an existing image from the image library, you can do that as well by clicking this custom built insert image block. It allows you to choose an image from the image library. The image library opens up in a model view. For instance, I want to insert this image. So select that and click set selected image and the image is inserted into the page. You can also set a caption in the editor if you want. You can set a slug value which acts as the post's URL path. I am setting it to sample post. You can also set an excerpt which becomes the description of the post. Above that you can set a featured image by clicking the image icon. This will open the image library from where we can choose a featured image. Choose a featured image from the image library and it will appear here. Save the article. Go back to the article index page where we can see the sample article along with the link that points to the front end view. Let me open that. Click the slug value. And this is how the post looks like. The next item in the navigation menu is the image library. We have already discussed how you can upload images from the article editor. In addition to that, you can also upload images directly to the image library by clicking the choose file button and then uploading. Below that you get a paginated view of all the uploaded images. It says there are four pages and each page is now displaying 12 images. Click the next button to navigate to the next page. It takes me to the next page showing page three of four. That's all for the image library. Now let's move on to the users page. Here we can manage the users. Currently the site has two registered users and I am logged in as the admin user Abhinav R. In addition to that, I have also created another user, a test user whose role is editor. Admin users have access to all the pages and content. Admins can create, delete or perform any action on any content. However, editors have fewer privileges. They can only modify their own posts and have limited access. This means we are implementing some form of authorization mechanism to check a user's privilege when accessing pages or performing actions. If you click on a user's name, it will take you to the respective user page. There you can modify details such as first name and other information. The role field is not editable, but you can change the password. Okay, now let's move on to the last page that is the settings page. It's quite simple. It contains three options, the ability to set the site title, site tagline and thumbnail size. Speaking of thumbnail size, thumbnail images are automatically generated when we upload new images. In this case, we are setting the width of the thumbnail images to 768 pixels. So whenever you upload a new image, our application will generate a smaller version of that image accordingly. With that, we have covered all the important features of the dashboard. Now let me log out from the application and it will redirect me back to the login page. Next, let's take a look at what all things I could learn by doing this project. Here's the list I have made. You can see that just one project goes through a variety of things. The first thing I learned is how to set up a PHP development environment using Docker. Docker allowed me to start the project with a Docker based environment instead of relying on other solutions like SAMP, WAMP and MAMP. Now let me go to the project directory opened in the code editor. Here is the directory structure. Within the root directory of the project, you can find the docker compose file. The docker compose file serves as a recipe for the stack we want to use. 
by allowing us to define the services to be used in the development environment in this docker compose file which is in dot yml that is yaml format three services are defined the web server which is nginx the programming language which is php and also the database that is mariadb which is a drop in replacement for mysql we can see that we we can you can also notice that we are mapping the port 8084 as well as the app directory and we are also adding the nginx configuration file to the docker container furthermore we are building the images for this container using the latest available nginx image from the docker hub moving on to the php container configuration we are developing a php image from a docker file and you can find the docker file here essentially the docker file contains the necessary commands to set up the php container it starts from the php fpm image and adds additional packages such as pdo pdo mysql etc in addition to that we are also setting up the x debug extension which facilitates php code debugging furthermore we can furthermore we configure the imagic extension which allows image manipulation tasks such as resizing images and setting compression quality in this project we utilize imagic extension when we upload images to the backend dashboard with imagic we can handle tasks such as resizing images and generating thumbnail images okay now coming back to the compose file next is the mariadb database settings it's mapped to a docker volume instead of storing it within the project directory or within the container storing the database in the container would result in data loss when the container is shut down so volumes are used to persist that data we are also mapping the port number 33094 on the local host to the port number number 3306 on the container which allows us to connect to the database with these settings that's how the docker compose file looks like essentially the docker compose file serves as a recipe for the stack we want to use now let's take a look at the nginx configuration file which is mapped here and here is the nginx configuration file it sets up the nginx server block for our localhost domain with the domain name php-cms.local it also sets the root directory of the web server to the app public folder if we open the app directory we can see the public directory where the site files are located additionally it sets up the basic location blocks this location block redirects all requests to the index.php file within the public folder and below that another location block handles all php requests so any request received by the nginx container will be passed to the php container at port 9000 thanks to the fast cga pass directive i hope the idea is clear the next thing I want to discuss is how to connect to the database. Since we are using Docker, PHP My Admin is not available by default, unlike on XAMPP or WAMP. Therefore, I have to choose another database manager called DBeaver. DBeaver allows you to connect to any kind of database, including MariaDB, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and so on. And here is how I did it. So basically you can consider dbeaver as an alternative to php my admin and it's desktop based. Here I have connected to the project database. 
and what do you see here are the tables in our project articles images permission settings and users moving down below let's discuss the project directory basically we have a public directory that contains all the site files such as images and page files this includes the index.php file outside the public directory we can store more sensitive things that are not site files and should not be directly accessible from the browser for instance the environment file which may contain secret data like application keys and api keys additionally we can see that it also contains some configuration files like webpack.config.js and package.json from npm as well as the composer json from composer and within the root directory of the project is where we have the docker compose file and other environment related files let's take a closer look at the public directory here i am opening the public directory it contains an admin folder which houses all the backend pages if you open that the directory structure goes like this the articles.php file is responsible for displaying the articles page which is the page you are currently viewing additionally we have the image library and other page files within the admin folder we have also a directory called includes at the same level as admin the includes directory contains all the php classes such as the image class article class etc the image class defines methods and properties for storing and retrieving, retrieving image details from the database as well as uploading images to the disk furthermore we have the templates folder which contains templates for the front end including the header footer article index page and article single page the uploads folder is where we upload where the uploaded images are stored it contains two sub folders one for storing the full size images and another for storing the thumbnail images regarding the front end all the front end requests are passed to the index.php file from nginx so that's all with the project structure now let's discuss some php related things you can learn from this project firstly you can learn how to connect to a database using php in php there are mainly two ways to connect to a database using the php pdo extension or the mysql i extension in this project i am using the php pdo extension php pdo is database agnostic meaning you can change to another database type if you want without worrying about the code if we go to the includes folder which contains all the php class definitions let me open the database class.php file this class is responsible for connecting to the mysql database in the db connect method i am calling the pdo constructor and passing the database host name database name database user and database password this is how you connect to the database using php if the connection is successful it returns a connection variable which is stored in the connection property and other classes will depend on this class to get the connection variable for instance if we take a look at the image class it has a private property called connection within the constructor of the image class we are also calling the db connect method of from the database class and storing the result in the connection variable of this class the next point is how to upload images using php and make use of the imagic extension as well as perform the basic file validation and store the image details in the database and finally save the image to the disk the image upload part starts from the admin image library.php file within the html section of that file you can find the form that allows users to upload an image moving to the top of the file you will see 
where we handle the image upload form submission. Once we retrieve all the data from the global files array, the script will call the add image method within the image class and pass the data array. We can find the add image method here in the image class. This method performs several tasks such as determining the folder structure based on the date and month of upload, image validation, regenerating the image using the iMagic extension, generating a smaller version of the image, writing the image to the disk and inserting the image details into the database. Starting from the validate image method, it checks if the image is in JPEG or PNG format. Then it checks the MIME type of the image file using the built-in PHP function functions fin for open and fin for file. It also checks the file size and looks for unnecessary characters in the file name. Additionally, it checks if the file was already uploaded before. If all the checks pass, it returns success. So regenerating the image works as an additional step to ensure the image is valid. It also helps reduce the file size in case the user uploads a large image file. In this method, the iMagic constructor is called and the uploaded image's temporary file, is, file name is read. The width and height of the image are calculated and the image is scaled accordingly. Finally, the method returns the image object. Similarly, the function to generate the thumbnail resizes the image to a smaller size, typically 640 pixels or the thumbnail size defined in the site settings. We have seen that during the demonstration. It also returns an instance of the iMagic class, variable image. Moving towards the top, we have the function to write the image to the disk if the validation is successful and the thumbnail is generated. It sets the compression quality for JPEG images to 80%. Then it calls the write image method of the image class to save the image to the uploads full size folder and the uploads thumbnails folder respectively. If the image is successfully written to the disk, the details are inserted into the database using the insert image method. So that's how the image upload process is handled within our application using PHP. Now let's move on to the articles section. Here we have the article index page and the editor page. All the operations related to articles are defined in the article class. It's quite similar to the image class. It defines the various functions like get article to fetch a single article, get article by slug to fetch an article from the database based on its URL. Also get articles to fetch multiple articles, update article to update an article, delete article to delete an article and so on. Next, let's move on to the users part. Our application allows users to log in to the admin area and the authentication is performed using PHP sessions. And here is a code for the login page where users can enter their username and password. And upon submitting the login form, we will call the authenticate method of the user class. To perform the authentication. You can find the user class inside the includes folder. As usual we have the basic CRUD operations defined within the user class. However the authenticate function is where we want to focus. This function retrieves the password from the users table based on the username. We use the PHP's built-in password hash function to hash the password and store it in the database. Then we utilize PHP's built-in password verify method to check if the retrieved password matches the entered password by the user. 
if the verification is successful authentication is considered as success otherwise authentication fails back in the login.php page we will check if the authenticate method returns true or false and if it's true then we will fetch the user by the username and store it to a variable called get user and if the get user status is true that means if the user is fetched successfully then we will move on and register the necessary session variables such as session username first name email and role out of this the session username is the one we use to verify if a user is authenticated or not so once the session variables are registered we will redirect the user to the articles.php page so let's take a look at the articles.php page here is the articles.php file and at the top of the file itself you can see that we are starting the session by calling the session start function and following that we are checking if the session username array key is empty or not if it's empty then that means the user is not authenticated and hence we need to redirect the user back to the login.php page and following that we have also added a die statement in order to prevent php from executing the rest of the code otherwise if the session username array key is set then the user is authenticated and access can be granted likewise i have added the session variable check to all the admin pages that i wanted to secure for instance the image library page edit user page etc so that's how authentication is handled it's quite straightforward right one important thing to note here is the registration page has not been added yet so once it's added there will be a form that allows the admin to add new users and during that process we will use the password hash function to store the hashed value of the password in the database speaking of the database let's take a look at the users table here we can see the structure of the users table it consists columns such as username and password where the password is stored in a hashed format the hashed value appears as a long string okay next let's discuss authorization i wanted it to be a multi user application in the users page you can see multiple users each assigned a role and the admin has the highest level of privileges while the editor has fewer privileges compared to the admin and it's common sense to understand that an editor should not be able to modify an admin but the opposite should be possible and this is where the concept of authorization comes into play to save time i have added a table called permissions and hard coded the permission rules right into the database it contains three columns the resource being accessed such as article admin user user settings etc then the action performed on that resource and the corresponding access rule for example if we look at the image resource and the update action both admins and owners can update an image this means that admins can update any image uploaded by any user while non admins can only update images that they own this is performed by checking the author value within the corresponding resource table for instance images have an author column lastly let's discuss the settings page which is quite simple it consists of three fields site title site tagline and the thumbnail size these settings are stored within the settings table okay next let's talk about security in php applications many people believe that php is insecure but that's a misconception with the help of php pdo prepared statements we can counter almost all sql injection attacks additionally php provides functions like html entities and html special cards which can prevent almost all xss that is cross site scripting attacks to further enhance the security we can use csrf tokens as well 
these tokens can be added to forms to prevent cross-site request forgery attacks. Speaking of prepared statements, let's examine the image class. Within the insert image function, you can see that I am using the prepare method on the PDO connection variable. It prepares an SQL statement to insert data into the images table. Instead of using actual values, we are using placeholders like file name, type, upload date, etc. preceded by a colon sign. Then we bind these placeholders to their actual values specifying the data type. Value binding is done using the bind param method. This approach effectively prevents SQL injection attacks. And another significant threat is cross-site scripting attacks, that is XSS attacks. To address this, I have a file called functions.php within the includes folder, within which I have defined a simple function called escape HTML. It passes the input string through the HTML special cares function, returning the escaped string. This helps in escaping unnecessary or harmful content within HTML such as script tags, making it safe for outputting in the user's browser. However, if you want to allow certain tags, a more sophisticated solution like HTML purifier can be used. So here is the article handler class which is responsible for rendering the article index page as well as the single articles page. Inside this class, I have defined a function called strip scripts, where I call the purify method of the HTML purifier class. In the definitions.php file, we are using the default configuration file provided by HTML purifier. By the way, this is an example of PHP dependency injection, showing how dependency injection is implemented. Now let's discuss routing on the front end. To handle page routing on the frontend, I used a PHP package called FastRoute which is available via Composer. If you look at the Composer.json file, you can see the dependencies for our project including FastRoute. So why did I choose FastRoute? The reason is that I wanted to have cleaner URLs on the frontend. So when you load a page on the frontend like this post. You can see the URL structure. It doesn't contain any query string. Instead, we use the URL path to resolve the article content. This approach is similar to WordPress and other content management systems that use pretty permalinks. Fast route is loaded through Composer's auto loader. Then we call the symbol dispatcher method of the fast route class. Within the symbol dispatcher, I have defined three routes. The first route is for resolving the index page, which calls the index method of the article handler class. The second route is for paginated pages. And the third route corresponds to the single article pages. Taking a closer look at the third route, which loads single post pages, it looks like article handler at single. So when the route is dispatched, we can access these details to call the appropriate class and the method. So fast route allows you to set the handler function to be executed when the request URL matches. And this handler function contains the code to be executed in order to get the data and render the page. The route handler class for a single post page is called article handler defined right here. The method to be called is single. The article handler class has a method called single. So let's take a look at that, which is invoked when a single post page is accessed. In the single method, data is fetched from the database, including the title, content, featured image, and other relevant information. Then the page is rendered, passing all the fetched data in an array called props. It also loads and renders the article single template, passing the props array to it. The templates including article single are located within the templates directory. 
each template is essentially a bunch of HTML that defines the structure of the corresponding page. Similarly, there is an article index template that loads the blog index page. In addition to that, there are header and footer templates as well. Now that we have covered routing using fast route, let's move on to the JavaScript part. Starting with the post editor, instead of a plain text area field, I wanted to implement a rich text editing experience using editor using the editor JS JavaScript package. And it's available on NPM. It provides a blog style editor similar to what you see on blogging platforms like WordPress. The editor.js package stores data in JSON format, allowing more flexibility in working with the created content. Earlier in the demo, you have already seen how editor.js works, where each part of the content is represented by a block, such as paragraph, image, etc. If you open the admin templates directory, and go to the footer template. You will notice that we are loading a JavaScript file located within the JS directory. Go to assets JS. Here it is. In the JS directory, you can find several JavaScript files, including one named editor.js, which is where we initialize editor.js. In the editor.js file, we call the editor.js constructor and store it in a constant called editor. Additionally, we define the components we want to use, such as the header component, list component, image component, and a custom built component called insert image. The insert image component allows you to select an image from the image library. By default, editor.js allows you to upload images directly to the editor. But I wanted the ability to insert images from the image library. So that's why I created the insert image block. For more information on creating custom components or blocks, you can refer to the editor.js website which provides detailed documentation on such topics. Next, let's discuss alerts. Whenever an action is performed, such as saving an image, an alert box is displayed. This alert box is made possible by Sweet Alert JavaScript package. You can visit the Sweet Alert website to learn more about it. This package is also installed from NBM, just like Editor.js. If you take a look at the main.js file, you will find the JavaScript code related to the article page. The code specific to articles is added within the articles.js file. At the top of the articles.js file, we import the sweet alert package. Scrolling down, you can see how the article save action is handled using JavaScript. If the backend responds with a success status, we call the sweet alert, that is SWAL function from sweet alert to display a success message. Otherwise, an error message is displayed. Likewise, sweet alert is also used within the image.js file. This file contains all the JavaScript code required for the image edit page. The image library JS file, on the other hand, contains all the code needed for the image library, such as opening the pop-up and so on. Now let's discuss how to organize files using JavaScript modules and how to bundle all these files using webpack and add them to the HTML using script tags. As you can notice, this application is not so small because it involves a lot of JavaScript code, including code for rendering the article editor, implementing light and dark modes and displaying alert boxes, among other things. So putting all the JavaScript code into a single file can make the file quite large and difficult to manage. 
To address this, the solution is to split the code into multiple files in a structured manner. As mentioned before, article.js contains all the JavaScript code for the article pages. Image.js contains image related JavaScript code and so on. While the main JS file is where everything is initiated. It imports the functions exported by other modules and registers the necessary event handlers. For instance, in the main JS file, you can see how it imports the delete image and save image functions from the image JS module. However, it's important to note that older browsers may not support JavaScript modules natively. Therefore, we need to transpile and bundle all these JavaScript modules together. This is where Webpack comes in. Webpack automatically handles the bundling process. Within the app directory, you can find a configuration file called webpack.config.js where I have defined the rules for bundling the JavaScript code. In this case, the main.js file is bundled into a file called bundle.js. Webpack takes care of all the module imports. This bundled file can then be included in the HTML using a script tag. So within the JS directory itself, you can find a file called bundle.js, which is automatically generated by Webpack. It contains all the required code for our site. Next, if you look at the dashboard, you can see that we are using icons from the Google Phones icons website. These icons are used in the navigation menu as well as for the dark and light mode switch. Finally, for styling the project both on the backend and on the frontend, I have used Bootstrap. Initially, I considered using Tailwind, but then I realized it could introduce unnecessary complexity to the project. Since it was originally meant to be a PHP project, I decided to go with Bootstrap. In the header.php file, you can see how we load the Bootstrap CSS file. Within the head section of the page. Similarly, in the footer.php file, we load the bootstrap javascript file. In the previous section, we had an overview of the project we have built. And in this section, I will show you how to set up that demo on your computer. And it takes only a couple of minutes. The whole thing is available in this GitHub repository. Link is in the description. It will be highly helpful if you wish to code along with me in the next video because there is a high chance that you will mess up with the code somewhere and feel stuck. Maybe an error from your side or sometimes even version mismatches. But I don't wish to waste your time with coding videos that don't work. So don't move on to the next video if you are unable to get this demo working first. In case any problem comes, tell me about it in the comments or report the issue on GitHub so that I can improve it. Okay, with that, let me walk you through setting up the demo app on your machine. By the way, if you have watched this far and finding it useful, then why not hit that like button if you haven't already. Also, YouTube says that nearly 94% of you are not subscribed to this channel. So consider subscribing if you want to watch more videos like this. In order for this demo to work, ensure that you have the following things available on your machine. PHP, NPM and Node.js. Composer, Docker, MariaDB client, dBeaver or PHP MyAdmin or any other database manager. Check out the links in the i button above to learn more about setting up Composer and Docker in case you are new to it. And here is the GitHub repository for the project and I have given the link in the description. You can check that. The first step is to get the HTTPS link of the repo, copy it to clipboard. Then open an appropriate project folder in a code editor. Here I am going to clone the repo to the desired folder, open a terminal, 
here i am using the built-in terminal in vs code then run the git clone command followed by the repo url okay the project is cloned to a directory called php cms and here is the project here are the project files however it's not complete because if we check the dot git ignore file you can see that we are ignoring the vendor and not modules folders so we need to install those apart from that here is a docker compose file the nginx configuration file the php doc docker file and the sql backup file the sql file contains the backup data okay first we want to install the php dependencies looking at the composer json file we have two dependencies move to the app folder cd php cms slash app from there we want to run the composer install command so make sure that you have composer installed on the system by running composer dash dash version if it's available then run composer install okay it has added a vendor folder to the project directory then run the npm install command which installs all the dependencies mentioned in the package json file it successfully added the not modules folder along with the dependencies the next step is setting up the local host domain name checking the nginx configuration file you can see that the domain is php-cms.local so let me open the hosts file on my linux machine it is located at hc slash hosts then add the loopback ip address along with the localhost domain name php-cms.local save the file and exit on windows and mac os the steps may be different next we want to set up the docker containers Here we have the web container which is mapped to port 8084. Similarly, we have the MySQL or MariaDB container which is mapped to port 33094. Along with that, we are also setting up the project database within the environment settings. This requires you to have Docker installed on your machine, by the way. If it's available move to the project directory then run the command docker compose build which builds the necessary containers after that run the command docker compose app dash d which starts the containers the three containers are now successfully started if you want to make sure of that run the command docker ps which lists the containers and here are the containers we just started Okay, however, we haven't yet set up the database, so we need to connect to the database. For that, I am going to use an application called dbeaver, which allows me to connect to the localhost database. Go to the database and select new database connection, select MariaDB, then on the next page, we can set up the connection details. The host name is localhost itself. The database name is PHP CMS, which is set up in the Docker Compose file. The localhost port is 33094. Below that, the username is Avinav and the password is password. And below that, you also need to set up the local client. This tells dbweaver about the location of the MySQL client executable on this machine. This is required to import a backup from an SQL file as well as to run SQL commands using dbweaver. On my machine, it's located at usr slash bin. If it's not installed on Linux, you can install it from the app repository. So in the terminal, if I search for MariaDB client with sudo apt search MariaDB client, you can find a package called MariaDB client. This is the one I installed. Furthermore, you can check if it's successfully installed by running the command mysql dash dash version and it says mysql version 15.1 is installed. So we can proceed. And by the way, MariaDB is a drop-in replacement for mysql so both 
works. Running the command dpkg s MariaDB client also reveals the same information. On Windows and Mac, you might want to check the respective guides to set up the MariaDB client. On Linux, I just run the command sudo apt install mariadb client and it installs the package for me to the location usr slash bin. Also, you can see here that the mysql file is a symbolic link to mariadb. Back to dbweaver, you can use the browse feature to select the path to this mysql executable. In this case, it's the usr slash bin directory which contains the executable. Complete the connection process and we are successfully connected to the database PHP CMS. However, the database currently does not contain any data. So we want to import the sample data from the SQL file available in the repository. Now, if we try to open the localhost domain name phpcms.local, we will get an SQL error, table not found. So in order to rectify that, right click the database, then go to tools and select restore database. Then select the SQL file from the computer that I have already downloaded and click open. By the way, the SQL file was part of the repository. Now click start to begin the import process. Once it's finished, close the window, refresh the columns and you will see the database tables with the imported data. For instance, here is the articles table which contains the blog articles. You can also see that the demo site successfully running on the log. Let me try logging into the admin area to see if it works. Logging in with the provided username and password. By the way, I will give the password and the username on the repository page itself. Okay, I am able to successfully log into the dashboard. And all the pages are working. Let me check the article editor. Yeah, it's functioning as expected. Yeah, that's all for this video, but I also plan to create a full video showing how I coded the entire thing. However, it's a bit long, so it can take a while for me to finish recording. And once it's finished, I will link to that here. And thanks for watching.